But today is a simple title. Today's message is entitled, That Guy, question mark. That Guy, question mark. Need to make a statement. It is this. When a believer or a church loses sight of the cross of Jesus Christ and its power that overcame the destruction of sin in their lives, the believer or the church simply becomes a religious person or institution. When they lose sight of the cross, when they lose sight of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The reason why this might happen is that maybe at times we feel that we weren't really that bad off before Christ. So therefore, what's the big deal? I've known people that have said to me, Pastor, I, you know, I was a good person. I've always been a good person. And I'm said, no, that's good. And they said, well, you know, I, I, I don't really need Christ in my life. And I respond, I, I guess I've always been this way, kind of, I beat around the bush, you know, I don't like to say things very bluntly because, you know, I just like to take the tender approach. I said, you know, there's a lot of good people burning in hell today because it's not about our good works. It's not about us being good. Am I really that good? Are you really that good? I mean, if we started just following the Ten Commandments, do we ding all ten of them or do we hit five out of ten? The fact of the matter is, when we think that our life before Christ wasn't that big of a deal or we think now our life isn't that big of a deal, we really didn't need Christ, we'll lose sight of the cross of Jesus Christ. So I, I have said this so often in, in, in the 38 years I've been in ministry, which blows my mind to, to say that out loud. But I've said this the entire time we've been here with the firehouse these last 16 years. That it's so important to get back to the cross. To always go back to what changed your and my life. It's important as a church that we always go back to the cross of Jesus Christ. Over the years I've been asked to come and sit and talk to some leadership in different churches that have struggled. Why they ask me, I, I'm confused. But then again, in the Old Testament, God spoke through a donkey. <laughs> the King James Version is a little different word in there, but I will use the NIV. So I always figure, I don't know what, you know, and I just share. And if anything I have found when his church is struggling, when politics in church have become more than the cross. It's because they've lost sight of the cross. They may have a cross in their sanctuary. They may have a cross on their roof. They may have a cross in their front yard. But the fact of the matter is they have lost sight of what the cross of Jesus Christ really is all about. It is important that you and I always go back to the cross. We need to get back to that relationship in which our hearts melted before the Lord. Let me say this to you. I, you've heard me quoted I, I, when I got saved, which was March 7th, 1975 at 11.05 p.m. I remember that. I remember it. Um, sure, and I were asking last night, was, no offense, son, but um, I'm like, when's Alex's birthday? And it's like October something, right? The 29th. And she goes, you don't know that. I go, no. I said, and when's Rachel's birthday? Our daughter-in-law married to JP. And, and she's, I said, is this, it's like September and whatever it is. September, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. The, so Chira looks at me. She goes, do you even know our own children's birthdays? I'm like, yeah, I was there. You were laying down. I was standing up, remember? Um, and so I rattled off the birthdays. Then she threw me a, a curve. Do you know the grandbaby's birthdays? I'm like, oh, snap. Yes, I do. <laughs> July 28th. And you know how I remember Adriana's? June 14th, because 14 is half of 28. 
good thing you didn't blow it and pick an odd number. I would have been shot. Why am I talking about this? <laughs> oh, I, I got you. I'm back. The reason is, I believe that in every one of your hearts, you need to have that moment that your heart has melted before the Lord. Not that quick, save me and move on with life. But where your heart is actually melted before the Lord. I gotta be honest with you, and I've said this many times. If you're a church person, if you've grown up in church, you have a harder time than I did melting before the Lord. Heathen kid. I married a PK, I was an HK. She was a preacher's kid, I was a heathen kid. And I'm gonna be honest with you, the longer you're in church, the harder it is to let your heart melt before the Lord. Why? Because it's all commonplace. But it's important that we get back to the relationship in which our hearts melted before the Lord. Listen, forsake the religiosity of man. It will only lead you and me away from Calvary. I don't know if I've ever said this to you before. Probably not again because, you know, I, I, I don't normally say things like this. I don't give a rip what a single person thinks of me. I could care less. Now, I don't mean to offend purposely, but I got to tell you, in my faith in Christ... If someone wants to rip me a new one because of my belief in Christ, rip away. Because I could care less. You know why? Because it is the most important thing in my life. And if it don't fit the mold of Christianity today, too stinking bad. I don't care. As long as I know that I please the Lord and I know what he's called me to do. See, you forsake then the religiosity of man. I see such a battle raging today. I see it more prevalent than ever before. Why? Because as time rolls on, the Bible is very clear. It says that man will grow more discontent. <laughs> Dude, we live in an unbelievable society today, not just our society, but across the world. Mankind, there is such unrest. There is such discontent it says that man will be more selfish it's all about me you would think that that wouldn't happen in churches but I've met and I've been in churches I've met people that church is all about them what will the church do for them how can they be ministered to them why aren't they giving them what they want people will become more selfish they'll become more independent meaning I don't need God, I have my life. I know what I'm doing, I will run my life. It's moving to a place where God isn't needed or even wanted anymore. And this, I believe, is happening so much in modern day Christianity today. What saddens me as a pastor is the fact that I see and I listened the other day. I was actually watching a pastor, a preacher guy. Somebody said, oh, you listen to this guy. And I never listened to him. So I listened to a message he preached. And I sat there. The place was jammed. Thousands of people in there. And I sat there. And, and I know I've been accused at times of not preaching out of the word of God. I know I preach out of a comic book. But the, the, the fact that, you know, I do understand God's word. And what this person was preaching about, I was like, Wow. I do not know where, biblically, this thing's going. And the people were on their feet. Yeah, you know, like, yeah, amen, and praising the Lord thing. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Is, anyone, is anybody stopping and taking a step back? And l let's look at the scripture again. Because, granted, you can take a little liberty and, you know, Share maybe your thoughts, but when you're preaching the gospel truth and it doesn't match up to what the gospel says, I think there's a problem there. But the fact is, in today, it's, it's about us. It's about what we have. And I see this struggle in, in Christianity today. The people are losing the love of the word of God. And they are more drawn towards the words of men of God. 
Today's message is about that guy. Now you're probably thinking, well, I just described that guy. That's not the guy that I'm talking about. In fact, it's probably not the guy that you're thinking about. It's about a different guy. It's about a different that guy. So whatever guy, that guy you're thinking about, it's not about that guy. It's about another guy. Who is that guy? And I wrote this down. I want to read this because I'm afraid if I try to say it without it, I'll screw it up. So here, you know the guy, that guy, who no one would ever believe or even consider that he or she, so when I say guy, it is, I don't know what it's called. It means both male and female. I don't know if, there's, if that's possible, but it didn't sound right going, that guy and that girl, it just lost something. <laughs> okay, so work with me. So when I say that guy, it could be male or female. All right, so let me go back. So that guy the one who you, no one would ever believe or even consider that he or she might act, actually come to know Christ. Any of you in here like that? That you are that guy that people would look at and go, not you. No way, not you. And you're sitting there going, yeah, I don't even know how I got here. But the fact of the matter is, you might be that guy. But let me, let me go on. But yet, then there's that other that guy who everyone thought that because of their religious pedigree, there's no way that that guy would ever fall away. So there's a couple different that guys. There's that guy that no one would ever believe would come to know Christ. Then there's that guy that, boy, he had everything, but yet he fell away from Christ. So as I present this message to you today, I want you to take a hard look at yourself and ask yourself this question. Am I that guy? Which guy? That guy. Turn your Bibles, because some of you are sitting there going, well, okay, it's 1013, you haven't even shared scripture yet. I'm going to be looking in the book of Luke, chapter 17. And I'm going to be looking at verses 11 through 19. I'll break them down as we go, but let me just give you this brief little thing right here as you turn to Luke 17. This is an account about that guy. In fact, how I see it, it's an account which is so important that God chose to put it into his word for all mankind to read about that guy. Luke 17, verse 11 says this. Jesus was traveling to a city and was on the border of Samaria and Galilee. Now, if you just read over that, that's like no big deal. Okay, so he's traveling to a city and he was on a border between Galilee and Samaria. Who cares? The fact is that there is something to care about because it explains the rest of the story. Here at this time, so you understand, Samaria and Galilee were, Galilee was, of course, the Jewish nation. Samaria were half-breeds. Back before the time of Christ, there was a blending of uh, of the Jews with a foreign nation, and the Sumerians were the pr product of this half-breed type thing. They were shunned, not, I shouldn't even say shunned, they were hated by the Jewish nation because of the fact the Samaritans were a black eye to them. They were like, you know, we want nothing to do with them. And on the other hand, the Samaritans... They weren't real big fan of the Israelis either because of all the accusation and the hatred that was shown to them. And you have to understand this so clearly as Christ is traveling to another city, he is on the border of Galilee and Samaria. He's walking straight between both countries or tribes of people. The thing is that they didn't ever want to mix together. The Samaritans knew their place. The Israelis knew their place. They wanted nothing to do with each other except right here. As he was traveling along the border, there is a place where both Jews and Samaritans came together. And it was this place where there was a label above them all and it said unclean. And it was written in bold letters so that for all to see, unclean. And the reason why they were unclean, they suffered from the disease of leprosy. 
And it is, leprosy is a highly contagious disease where it causes nerve endings to die off, which causes the blood flow to quit going to your limbs. And without you really knowing it, you begin to drop off appendages of your body. It eventually kills you. There is no cure back then for, uh, for leprosy. If you got it, whether you were from Galilee or Samaria, you were cast away because it was so highly contagious. And here they were in this camp for lepers. And the sign didn't say Galileans and Samaritans. It simply said unclean. They both had to be separated from everybody else that they knew because they were unclean. They knew that they were unclean. There was no denying it. It's, they could see what would happen eventually. In the beginning, there might be a small bump that would appear on one of their hands or on their foot or on their face. And right away, because they've seen it, they would probably try to hide it, cover it up until more started showing up. And then once more showed up, people saw that. And when people saw it, they reported it. And then the priest came and would look at the person and say, you are covered with leprosy. Go, depart from us. Get away. You must leave now. They weren't allowed to go back and get their belongings. They weren't allowed to do anything. They had to go because they were unclean. They knew they were unclean. And let me say this. The leprosy represents sin. I'll get to that in a moment. The difference between leprosy and sin is if you got leprosy, you see it and you admit it. But what we do is we have sin in our life and we hide it. I'm going to tell you what. Whether you hide your leprosy or you hide your sin, either way, it's going to eat your life completely up. Now, the Bible says, for example, the leprosy knows no boundaries, neither does sin. In Romans chapter 3, verse number 23, one of the most powerful, life-changing scriptures that ever hit my heart. And at a very young age of coming to know Christ, this was one of those that just slammed me. And it said this, all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All men. My uncle, and again, not growing up in a Christian home, my uncle, the one, you know that uncle. I've talked about Uncle John before. He was my mom's brother. Uh, graduated the eighth grade, uh, which means not like you all graduate the eighth grade, which is just insane. Uh, he actually, the eighth grade was as far as his education went. He went and worked in the coal mines of Pennsylvania and then worked for a machine shop, had a mechanical mind, became a multimillionaire because he designed products and stuff, but he was still Uncle John. He was the guy you walk in, he'd say, pull my finger. Okay, and if you've never had an uncle like that, you need one. It's kind of like just, you know, you, you bring your friend up. Hey, Uncle John, ask him, hey, come over here and pull my finger and pull her finger. Okay, so, you know, it's just, I, I know it's not probably proper to talk about in church, but oh well. Uh, it, but, you know, he used, he used to make a statement way back when, I'll try to clean it up as much as possible, and they, they would say something about when someone goes to the bathroom, number two, okay, that it's, they, they think it doesn't stink. Again, I cleaned that up the best I can. And it's, it's vulgar and it's ignorant, but it's... All men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Somehow people think that they got these holy underwear on that just cleans things completely. And they just cover everything over. Let me tell you, look at me. All the ends are sinners. Filthy sinners. Every stinking one of you. Me too. There's nobody in this church that isn't a sinner. Thank the Lord. But I've been in churches where everybody thinks that they're not sinners. And people don't think that they're a sinner. But when you realize the magnitude of your sin and that you understand that the only way to be released from that sin is through Christ Jesus, all of a sudden your heart begins to melt. In verse number 12, 
as the story is described there in Luke. It says, 10 men who had leprosy met him, stood at a distance because they were not allowed to go near people. You started approaching someone, like if I was walking down the street and someone who had leprosy was walking towards me, their responsibility was to say, unclean. And they then would have to cross the street to get away from me. I wouldn't have to cross the street. They would. So from a distance, they see Christ, and they called out, and it's interesting how they describe this. Is, is loud an adjective? Or is it a pronoun? Okay, none of you know English either in this church. I, I, what, it's an adjective. Thank you, Mrs. Rice, school teacher, who was Alexis' favorite school teacher because you never raised your voice. Uh, but, so it's an adjective. What's that? <laughs> describe something. Gotcha. Okay. An adjective. I knew it was something. So it describes. It's an interesting adjective used there. They call out in a loud adjective describing something. Voice. Jesus, master, have pity on us. Jesus, master, have pity on us. Now, I would normally yell that to, to, to add the dramatic effect. But there's babies sleeping in that section. I don't feel like just freaking them all out. So we'll, I'll try to keep them. But imagine, they're like, Jesus, have mercy on us. They're yelling at the top of their lungs. Now, here's the thing that's interesting. Obviously, they knew who Christ was. They knew who Christ was. So there were Samaritans in the camp and there were Jews in the camp. Because they knew when they saw him, they're like, oh, what first? They called him master. Master, have pity on us. They also cried out because they knew what he could do. So they knew about him. They knew about him. In verse number 14, it says, when Jesus saw them, he had pity on them. I love that verse. Christ has pity on people. We're the ones that don't. We do not have pity on people. I mean, we try. I hope we, we grow in it. But we're the ones that lack the pity and the mercy and the grace for people. And I'm as guilty as you are, maybe if not more guilty. But I'm telling you what, it's a battle that all of us face and it's a battle that could be won when you realize the amount of pity that's been shown to you and the grace that's been shown to you and the mercy that's been shown to you through Jesus Christ. So anyway, when they saw him, he had pity on them. He said, Christ said to them, go show yourselves to the priest. And they went and they were cleansed. Hallelujah, 10 out of 10, smack dab, let's go. Chalk it up for Christ, add it to the healing power. There they go, 10 of them, off they go. As they go, they are cleansed. Now I'm just picturing how they're walking away, all the white spots all over their body. Now I don't know if they were like a salamander and their tails grew back. I don't know if they grew new appendages back. I don't know, what, I don't know how that worked. But I do know that they were cleansed, meaning the leprosy they had, the white marks that they had, were gone, for they were healed. All 10 were cleansed. All 10 were given the same opportunity. Now again, we do not know the ratio of the mix there. We don't know if it was five and five, eight and two, seven and three, six and four, uh, one and nine, nine and one, four and seven, and minus one, minus one, minus one, they died, uh, minus one. So we, we don't know, we just know there was 10. There was 10. Yet, that guy was different. That guy. Verse number 15. One of them, when he saw he was healed, returned back to Christ, praising God in an adjective. In a loud voice. In a loud voice. One of them, when he saw he was healed, returned back to Christ, praising God, praising God in a loud voice. Now, God's not deaf. You don't have to yell at God. But there's an excitement to this guy. 
Now they were supposed to go to the priest to, so the priest could look at him and go, you're clean. Dude didn't make it too far. Because as he's going, all of a sudden he realizes, dude, all my white spots are gone. I'm clean. I'm, I'm, I'm clean. He didn't have to go to the priest to find out. He was clean. It's interesting, though. He was just as loud to praise God after his healing as they all were to receive their healing. How many times when our butt's in a sling and life has hit the fan, we're all about crying out to God, oh God, oh God, oh God. And as soon as whatever's resolved, as soon as the pain has been healed, as soon as the sorrow has been hidden over by things, all of a sudden are we still praising God in the same way we were before? Or are we that guy? You know, that guy. Here I am, Lord, help me. Here I am, Lord, help me. He helps us and then we're no longer crying out to the Lord. I mean, that's convicting, folks. That really makes you, really makes you just take a step back and think, are you, are you that guy? Are you the one that cries out, but yet when things go your way and you forget all about him? This guy didn't. He didn't care who was around. He didn't care what people thought. I mean, he was a leper. He was already at the bottom of the food chain. Now he's coming back praising God. I can just see him as he's running towards Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, thank you. And he's saying this all in uh, like a different language. All right, and, and so, so I'm just translating for you because it, it could have been Arabic or, or Aramaic. It could, have been, it could have been Italian. I'm not sure. I'm just, I'm just translating for you. And he says, thank you, thank you, Jesus. There's something about praising the Lord. There really is. There's something about it. Not showtime. Not let's bring out the dancers and the, all the other nonsense. It's just about praising the Lord and thanking him. Verse number 16. He then threw himself at the feet of Christ. And thanked him. Now, at my age, I could not throw myself at anybody. I would slowly get to my knees and then lay very slowly in front of him. That whole throwing thing left a long time ago. But in my heart, I'd be like, sometimes I, you know, like my grandson says, Papa, jump with me. I am. He goes, No, Papa, jump with me. I am. He goes, No, Papa, jump with me. I said, Xander, inside of here, I am. But you see the x-rays of my knees. I'm not. You know what he told me during prayer? Can I share this? We're walking. Xander's walking with me during the clock prayer. And I'm just praying out loud. He goes, Papa. Papa. I'm like, what, Xander? Too loud. <laughs> too loud, Papa. I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's the best. If that was my kid, I would have knocked him across the room. Grandkid, oh, you're the best. <laughs> he threw himself at the feet of Christ, and he thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Not a single word in the Bible is there by mistake. God says, you know what? Yins need to hear this. And he said, Yins. Okay. He said, Yins need to hear this. He was a Samaritan. He was that guy. This guy knew the magnitude of his disease. And he knew how undeserving he was. Because Christ, the Jews, were the children of God. He was a half-breed. He was not a child of God. He was the, 
the drugs of the earth. He was lower than life. And then you throw leprosy on top of it. He was unclean, unclean, unclean. He had nothing. He was undeserving of, of any, any charity. He was undeserving of any compassion. He was undeserving of anything because he was scum. And here this man comes back after seeing he was cleansed and he threw himself at the feet of Christ and he thanked him and he was a Samaritan. He was that guy. That's what brought him back. And that's what should bring us back. That the magnitude of his disease and how undeserving he was, but yet Christ cleaned him. See, when you think that you don't need it, you ain't going back to him. You will not, you will become one of the most religious people that you'll ever see. When people say, you know, I say to them, so do you know Christ? I go to church. I go, so does the devil. No, I, I'm this. I'm, and they throw the title out at me that they're this denomination or that denomination. I'm like, who really cares? You know, I've said this before. People think that there's going to be all these divisions in heaven. There's going to be all these different denominational places. You know, the Catholics will be over there. They'll be a little bit more quiet. The Methodists, the Lutherans, the Pentecostals, they'll be way over there. They're too loud. <laughs> and then Jesus asked, I got to hurry. Jesus asked this. Hey. Well, I don't know if he said hey. But he probably did. They just don't, it probably just didn't translate properly. Could have said, yo, but let's go with, hey. Hey, weren't there 10 of yins? Again, yins. Weren't, weren't there 10? Question mark. Now, is Jesus having a senior moment? He was only 30 some years old. Like, like he was like, wait a minute. Uh, just like 10 minutes ago, I, I thought there was 10. What, wasn't there 10? Can you imagine somebody looking around like, what, dude slipping a gear already? What, yeah. Then he says this question, where's the other nine? Again, is he slipping? Now, here's the fact. Jesus knew there were 10, and he knew where the other nine were. He knew. He just threw that out there like, wait. He threw that out there so all of us would see, wait. Weren't there 10? Where's the other nine? Now, the question is, did those other nine really obey what Christ told them to do? Go to the priest so that they could be cleansed. Or did they simply go back to their old lives before leprosy? Why do I have to go do what he said? I'm already healed. Aren't we that way? We get saved and we go back to living our old stinking life again. Why? We don't need it now. I'm saved. Are you? I mean, is your heart really melted before the Lord to the place where you want to, re that old life repulses you and all you want is that new life in Christ? You want that, that freedom and that hope and that cleansing in Christ? Is that what you want more than anything or do you go back to your old stinking life? We all face it. We all face it. Now, all we know is that this guy got what the other nine guys didn't get. Read verse number 19. Christ says this to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. You're, you, could, you could take a step back and go, Pff. well, we just read that the 10 of them got healed. He came back and he thanked Jesus. What do you mean he got something that the other nine didn't get? It says here that your faith has made you well. Okay, but the other nine... They were made well. They must have had faith. So what's the big deal about this guy? In Mark chapter 5, verse number 34, there's a story about a, I picture a little, little lady person who had an issue of blood. She was bleeding constantly. They wouldn't stop bleeding. And it was a very uh, a terrible thing back then. She could bleed to death over time. And it says that she worked her way through the crowd, and when she touched the hem of Jesus' garment, she was healed, and Christ looked at her and says, Woman, your faith has made you whole. The word faith in the book of, of Mark and the word faith here in this scripture is a Greek word, which means saved. Saved. Oh, God might heal somebody. Doesn't mean they're saved. He got something those nine others didn't get. He not only got cleansed, but he got himself saved. 
And when those other nine die, here's the fit thing. You may all, we all want us. We all want to live healthy. We want to all live whole lives. We all want to be healed here. But what's most important, God would rather have us come to the kingdom of God through Christ Jesus, broken, diseased, or whatever, and still have our souls secure in him rather than showing up at the pearly gates in front of the Lord, healthy as a horse, and him look at you and go, depart from me for I know you not. You understand, this dude got it, man. He's like, I got to go back and thank the Lord because of what he has done for me. When you go back to Christ because you see the magnitude of your sin, you then, therefore, you will go to him and you will thank him. You will come to church. I'm telling you, you will come to church a different person when you come with a thankfulness in your heart, you will come to a prayer meeting with a thankfulness in your heart. You will lead, you will, you will volunteer with a difference in your heart when you realize and understand the magnitude of the cleansing that you have received. And I just don't want to hear, I just don't want to hear, Lord, I don't want him to say you're cleansed. I want him to say your faith has made you well. Jesus, I can tell you as God is my witness, Jesus saved me. And if I say that every Sunday for the rest of my life, and that's the entire message, some people would grow weary that. I'm not going back to that church. He says it the same thing every week. Tell a story that means nothing about the scripture and everybody will go, hallelujah. You're, 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 you're causing a disruption in the atmosphere with your faith. What? I'd rather hear a loud voice, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Capiche? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word that is so powerful and effective. And I thank you, God, that it's an encouragement to all our souls. Lord, I pray, oh, Lord, I've prayed that, God, that people's lives would be changed because of your word, because of your Holy Spirit, because of truth. Lord, there are people here whose hearts are broken. There are people here whose hearts have not known the love and the mercy of Christ. They haven't asked. I pray today's their day, Lord. With your head bowed for just a moment, we do this every week. We give people the opportunity to pray and ask Christ to come into their life, to make him Lord or your Savior, to be, that, be like that leper who came back and said, thank you. But you got to start by asking him to come into your life. If you want that, how we do it here is I'm going to pray for you in just a moment, but I'm going to ask you to look at me. And if you want prayer, I want to get eye contact with you. Then I will lead you in prayer. And then you're going to ask Christ to come into your life. And it's going to be life changing for you. Doesn't mean you're not going to have struggles. You will. Doesn't mean you're going to do it perfect. You'll fail. But the fact of the matter is you'll keep going back to the cross, back to the cross, back to the cross, because that's where we find our life. If you want that hope today, if you want that prayer, to pray that with me today, starting on my left, look at me right now. All I got to see is your eyes. Sure, any others? Got them. My right. All I got to see is your eyes. Sure, cool. Got them. Any others? All right, pray this from your heart. Lord Jesus, I surrender. All of who I am, I give up. No longer me. But Lord Jesus, I want it to be you in me. So Jesus, come into my heart today. Forgive me my sin. I'm new. I'm cleansed. I receive it in Jesus' name. We're going to take communion.